Hey class, uh, welcome to week 12. We're actually going to combine week 12 and 13 into a single uh, two-week module. So we're going to be talking about risk management, um, state and local risk management, um, and also emergency response at all levels of government. So we are going to cover the phases of all hazards management uh, from planning through response. And we're going to spend some time focusing on risk management, risk communication, and then emergency response activities pursuant to the Stafford Act. We will also talk briefly about legal issues in emergency management, um, including things like contracting for assistance uh, through interstate compacts, mutual aid agreements, uh, etc. So as I've said before, I'm an attorney. I am not an emergency management professional, um, but I do support a lot of our emergency management operations at the university. Um, and that includes things like risk management, lab safety, uh, responses to chemical spills and other lab accidents, um, as well as our nuclear reactor. So I do work closely with a lot of our first responders and risk management personnel. I do want to provide a really high level review of all hazards management just to orient anybody who is not familiar with it. Um, those of you who work in all hazards management and emergency response, obviously you're going to know this stuff like the back of your hand. But for those who don't, all hazards management means preparing for, coordinating, and carrying out all emergency functions um, unless another government agency is responsible for those. And those are functions to prevent, minimize, and repair or mitigate injury and damage that results from a disaster. So this includes providing police services, uh, firefighting, and other rescue services. It encompasses giving warnings to the public, managing transportation, restoring utilities, and coordinating with local communities. The four phases of all hazards management are prevention, preparation, response, and recovery. And it shouldn't surprise you, but there are legal issues that intertwine through all of these phases. So all hazards management, that does not mean that you have to plan for literally everything. Um, no organization, no jurisdiction has the sufficient resources to plan for everything. Um, and even if they did, it's just not possible to foresee every single hazard. So instead, all hazards management requires planning for the risks that are most likely to hit your area, um, plus risks that are less likely but still plausible. Uh, so part of an all hazard management plan should include the ability to respond to multiple disasters at once. Um, we covered this a little bit in a prior lecture um, where during the hurricane season, you know, FEMA was just really unprepared to handle so many different disasters at one time. So good all hazards management includes both risk analysis um, that focuses on the community's vulnerability to specific hazards and also functional planning, because you want to be able to build capacity to respond to emergencies. Um, and again, you especially want to be able to respond to multifaceted emergencies. So governments, as well as other organizations, they use risk analyses to develop continuity of operations plans. And we'll talk about these um, a little bit later in the lecture, but these plans ensure that even during a disaster or some other emergency, the government can continue to operate and protect the public health and safety. That means doing things like delivering critical services to the public, uh, mitigating environmental harm, um, and ensuring the financial integrity of the community. While carrying out continuity of operations plans, the government's also got to provide competent management. And that's because you need to be able to inspire public confidence that the government actually has the ability to respond to and resolve the crisis. Uh, so if, if you want the public to follow the guidance and instructions um, that the government and public officials are putting out there, they really need to have public confidence. So since assessing potential risks is part of all hazards management, let's take a look at some of those risks. Um, so first, we've got natural disasters. And the feds define natural disasters to include hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, landslides, snowstorms, fires, floods, and explosions. And every community is vulnerable to natural disasters. Um, in the U.S., because we're such a large country, 
you know, different parts of the country are prone to different types of natural disasters. You know, the whole southeast, uh, east coast, um, definitely a risk for hurricanes. The Midwest is at risk for tornadoes and floods, and the western part of our country gets hit with earthquakes, avalanches, landslides, volcanoes, and fires. And although certain parts of the country are more likely to experience one type of disaster than another, almost any of these disasters could hit any part of the country. Uh, the exception might be a hurricane, which is, you know, unlikely to hit somewhere in the Midwest. Um, but it's not completely impossible. Um, so, for example, Maryland, uh, where I live, is not prone to having tornadoes. But several years ago, a tornado touched down on the University of Maryland campus and actually killed two students. Um, so even though we don't normally get tornadoes, they do happen occasionally and they can lead to deaths. Uh, similarly, we think of volcanoes as more tropical, uh, you know, so in the U.S., maybe mostly Hawaii's problem. But when Mount St. Helens in Washington state erupted back in 1980, 57 people were killed. And that death toll would have been much higher had Mount St. Helens erupted on a work day. Uh, you've got Colorado, not typically prone to flooding, yet in the fall of 2013, many parts of Colorado found themselves under really dangerous flood war uh, waters. You know, Boulder was especially hard hit. Um, there were at least eight deaths, 11,000 evacuations, and over 20,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. Um, we typically think of that type of problem in Colorado as fires, but in that case, it was water. And while I was preparing this course, uh, so back in December and early January, I thought that I was going to be focusing pretty heavily on wildfires and the responses to them. And that's because, um, you know, in 2018, California's campfire was the deadliest, most destructive fire in California history. You know, 85 people died. And Pacific Gas and Electric just recently pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Um, additionally, you know, Australia just went through an absolutely devastating bushfire season where it really looked like the whole continent was on fire. Um, I've got cousins in Sydney. Uh, they've got a pretty nice posh apartment on the bay uh, where normally you can look out their kitchen window and you see, you know, the bay and all the, the boats and the harbor. And they sent some pictures and you couldn't see anything at all. It was just a wall of smoke. Um, and they did not have to evacuate and they weren't injured, but that's how bad the fires were. So wildfires seemed like a natural choice, uh, no pun intended, for this semester. And then the coronavirus pandemic hit. So let's talk about outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. These are not included in the federal definition of a natural catastrophe, but they can be natural disasters and they can also be consequences of a natural disaster. Uh, you know, worldwide, many natural disasters are quickly followed by outbreaks, epidemics, and even pandemics. So an outbreak is more regional. It's an increase in a regional infectious disease. If it's not controlled, it can spread. Uh, it can affect a substantial number of people in the region or the country, uh, so that becomes then an epidemic. And if an epidemic is uncontrolled, it can become a pandemic which spreads across continents, and that's what we are seeing now. So when I gave this week's lecture last time I taught the class, last year, I noted that epidemics and pandemics are far bigger risks in the developing world, but that we should all worry about infectious disease because our world is so interconnected. And in less than a day, you know, you can get to Tokyo, from Tokyo to New York City. Um, at the time, I was thinking about viruses like Zika, Ebola, and SARS. Um, th those have been in the news over the past few years. But now, unfortunately, we are seeing a global pandemic that really makes those other outbreaks look pretty minor. Um, and epidemics and pandemics, they're particularly challenging because they're not limited in time necessarily. Um, and they also put first responders at great risk. So that's why right now, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the most important things that we can do is stay home. Just stay home as much as possible, 
um, engage in social distancing and, and protective measures like wearing masks and gloves when you have no choice but to be out in public. In addition to natural disasters, there are man-made disasters, uh, and these can be accidental or intentional. Um, so we can have oil spills, uh, like the BP spill, uh, chemical spills, gas leaks, infrastructure collapse. So that could be dams, bridges, electrical grids, the, you know, any type of public infrastructure. We can have nuclear meltdowns and other radiological events. Um, there can be industrial accidents that create an emergency. There can be transportation accidents like derailed trains and airline crashes. Um, these can all lead to additional disasters. You know, if a derailed train hits a fuel refinery, that could be bad. There are also sports disasters, um, forms of civil unrest, and then acts of terrorism. So that's, you know, conventional bombs, dirty bombs, attacks on the water supply and infrastructure, active shooters, things like that. So civil unrest, um, that would be like demonstrations, riots and strikes, uh, sports disasters. <laughs> You're probably thinking sports disasters, but yes, um, particularly soccer because of, uh, I guess, you know, my family grew up playing soccer, but I suppose we're a bit of hooligans now and then. Um, and in 1964, in Peru, 300 soccer fans were killed and another 500 were injured because there was a riot uh, following a bad call in a game in a Peru versus Argentina soccer game. Um, in 1982, there was a similar soccer disaster in Moscow. 340 people were killed, um, basically because the fans got collided when trying to leave and others were trying to get in. And then the Boston Marathon bombing uh, several years ago, kind of a combination sports disaster and a terrorist act. All right, we've looked at some risks. So how do organizations, how do governments go about planning for those potential risks, uh, other disasters? And that is through the process of risk management. And risk management should be an ongoing process and it should cover the entire organization. And by cover the entire organization, I mean that risk managers should be taking a comprehensive view of risks to the whole agency or organization or community. And they should be engaging personnel at every level of the organization, um, you know, to ensure that risk management plans are implemented at every level and within every particular unit of an organization. Risk management, again, it includes both risk identification and risk evaluation. So for risk identification, you've got to understand the sources, types, and likelihoods of risk. Um, so this means understanding not just your physical environment, uh, you know, which would be the potential for a natural disaster um, or an infrastructure failure, or even the ability of a bad actor to create risk. You, but you also need to examine the legal, political, operational, economic, and social environments too. So when examining um, the operational environment, you know, the day-to-day -day activities of an organization, risk managers also need to look at the internal attitudes towards risk. So some organizations are more risk averse than others. And a good risk management plan has got to take into account the potential for an individual or an organizational unit to take on risks, you know, either unintentionally um, or because the unit decides to circumvent the risk management office or the legal office uh, or upper level decision makers. Now, typically from an attorney's perspective, when I see that happen, it's a financial risk. You know, it's not the risk of an inability to respond to a disaster. Um, but still risk managers do need to be aware of, you know, who's gonna play by the rules and who might be a little bit extra problematic. To implement a risk management program, um, an organization should establish policies and procedures that include a statement of the goals of the organization. Uh, it should identify officials or personnel who are charged with carrying out risk-related functions. Uh, that would be planning, organization, coordination, implementation, monitoring, you know, things like that. Um, also, that program should provide guidelines for how to make decisions, particularly during an emergency. So these policies and procedures, 
they should consider what we call risk treatment, which is how best to treat and respond to a certain type of risk. And the main types of risk treatment are reduction, transfer, avoidance, and acceptance. So a decision to reduce risk, um, that may include sort of prevention and control measures like training and inspections. Uh, you could transfer risk to a partner organization or contractor, um, including through the use of appropriate liability clauses or the purchase of additional insurance, although this can be challenging on the government side. Um, a lot of times if agencies are self-insured through a statewide program, it's, it's very challenging to purchase commercial insurance. Now, sometimes an organization will decide to avoid risk entirely, um, you know, by deciding not to provide certain services or not to take certain actions. Again, on the government side, you know, any decision to avoid risk, that's got to conform to statutory requirements. So, you know, if you think about the federal government, if Congress tells an agency that it has to take an action, you know, such as making the Nuclear Regulatory Commission responsible for inspecting nuclear facilities, then the agency has to take that action. You know, the NRC can't simply decline to inspect nuclear plants because of the liability that it might incur uh, due to a poor inspection. But it's essential that officials throughout the organization are aware not only that the policies and procedures exist, but they also need to ensure that the risk management plan and any risk responses are effectively implemented. Finally, the whole risk management program, policies and procedures, all of that, that should be reviewed at the very least annually. Now, organizations can't plan for risks they're not aware of. So the first step of uh, risk mitigation is gonna be assessing the biggest risks that face a particular organization. Obviously, you gotta ex examine external risks, but you also need to look at internal processes. You know, a lot of the biggest risks come through a gap in a policy or a lack of compliance. So compliance risk assessment, basically it involves comparing current operations in each department with how the proper policies and procedures. So how a department should be operating uh, versus how it actually is operating. And this might sound like a daunting task or something that needs a lot of risk management expertise, but it doesn't have to be. You know, taking time to conduct uh, some in-person interviews or shadowing people at their jobs, that really allows organizations to see where there are gaps that need to be addressed. Policies and procedures, these guide internal operations, and they also help ensure that every employee within an organization understands the rules and expectations. So these should be in writing, um, having written policies decreases legal liability because it shows that you are actually trying to take the proper steps, uh, that you are implementing safe practices. But these policies and procedures also need to be living, changing documents. You know, keeping policies and procedures up to date is an essential part of risk mitigation. If you have outdated policies or procedures, that can actually increase the risks um, because they might not address current regulations or current technology. Um, or a current understanding of risks. So again, really important to review these policies and procedures on a regular basis. And those reviews should involve representatives from different departments, uh, you know, different subject matter experts, basically. And again, it's not enough just to have the policies in place. You need to make sure that your personnel have read and understand those policies. Um, it's good to have some type of written record that shows that you know the employees have reviewed policies um, because that means that you're properly educating your personnel and again it also helps limit your legal liability regular trainings that can also help organizations and their personnel limit liability because training helps employees see you know how to apply these policies and procedures to their day-to-day -day work it helps employees understand not just how to do their specific jobs, but also how to implement these higher level policies um, and apply those to day-to-day -to -day behavior. So ultimately, planning is about assessing the risks and prioritizing accordingly. Uh, planning at all levels of government is required by the Stafford Act. So for instance, 
all uh, local governments have to, you know, have plans in place that describe how they're going to mitigate hazards. Um, they're going to identify specific risks, you know, and then have strategies to mitigate those risks. State governments have to describe their actions that they're going to take to mitigate hazards, um, show how they're going to support local governments, um, how they're going to provide, you know, technical assistance, um, and then, you know, identify additional resources. Preparation can't just be done by emergency managers, though. Um, it really should be community-based because understanding the composition of your population, that's quite important, and it needs to occur at the outset of the planning effort. Um, so you need to account for people with disabilities, other people with um, functional needs or access needs, uh, needs of children and pets, your demographics, what resources are available you know, in your community. All of that can really have a profound effect on emergency response, particularly evacuation, shelter operations, and family reunification. Uh, so for example, you know, what if the majority of people don't have cars, like in New York City? You're going to have to devote more resources to transportation than you would in a community where most people have cars. Um, if you've got a significant population of people who speak a language other than English, you've got to address that. And it probably can't just be English and Spanish. Um, in the D.C. area, you know, we're home to a lot of ethnic Ethiopians and Vietnamese. Uh, the university has a lot of Chinese students. So our forms that relate to emergencies and healthcare have to be in many different languages. You also have to know about any businesses that operate in your area, um, particularly special operations. You know, do you have a hospital? Uh, is there a major defense contractor in your community? Things like that. And this is why it's important to include community leaders from all across the spectrum in the planning process. You know, it's gonna help you understand your risks and your resources, and it also helps the community understand the concept of readiness. And while the causes of emergencies can vary greatly, a lot of the effects do not. And so planning can address common operational functions. You know, you don't have to have a unique plan for every hazard or threat. Uh, because a lot of them, you know, if you have a flood or a wildfire or a hazmat release, you might have to evacuate and open shelters, you know, in any of those cases. So there are different characteristics, you know, but the general of a hazard, I mean, but the general tasks for conducting the evaluation, I'm sorry, the evacuation um, and shelter operations, you know, those are pretty much the same. So you want your plans to be flexible and adaptable. But you also need to keep in mind that very few people will read a very lengthy policy and procedure. Um, so you've got to get buy in from the community by explaining it you know, as clearly and concisely as possible. So again, you know, all hazards planning, that does not mean that an organization is going to pre be prepared for everything. And it doesn't mean that it's going to carry out its operations without any mistakes. Um, former White House Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor Lisa Monaco uh, just had a recent interview with the Washington Post and said that the idea of preparation meaning no mistakes and smooth sailing is just not accurate. Instead, preparation is about trying to minimize chaos, uh, particularly at the beginning of an emergency. You know, and you minimize chaos by planning ahead and having structures in place to move quickly when disaster does strike. So plans are essential, but organizations, particularly governments, need to have systems in place that allow for improvisation, um, you know, quick action to deal with unexpected conditions on the ground. And that requires integration and coordination across all levels of government, and it requires institutional knowledge. So the degradation of our federal civil service over the past few years has been deeply troubling because as long-time government career civil servants leave, institutional knowledge goes with them, and that is not easily replaced. You know, and over the past few decades, um, and especially over the past few years, we have seen a real deterioration in the federal government's capacity to engage in large-scale improvised responses to emergencies. That lack of capacity, it's been blindingly obvious in our federal government's lack of a coordinated 
cohesive response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's just been an obvious lack of planning across the board. There are three tiers of planning. Um, so you've got strategic planning at the top. You know, that's how a jurisdiction wants to meet its uh, emergency management or homeland security responsibilities. And that's long term. You know, it sets the context and the expectations for operational planning. It's the operational planning that gets more into the roles and responsibilities, you know, the, the more specific actions, and that provides a framework for tactical planning. Tactical planning is your sort of on the ground, you know, managing personnel, equipment, and resources. And it's a good idea to engage in pre-incident tactical planning um, because then you get to pre-identify personnel and equipment, et cetera, that are available to you. So from an attorney's perspective, it's crucial to properly address all three tiers of planning and to make sure that you have properly disseminated that information within your agency um, and also to the public to the extent that you're responsible for doing that. It's the failure to plan or the failure to plan adequately. If that leads to, you know, that leads to injury, death, and property loss. And all of those things, in addition, lead to lawsuits. So part of the planning process is also recovery planning. You know, there's a lot of focus on mitigation and how you respond. But recovery planning is important because that gives you a smoother transition uh, from your response activities to short-term recovery operations to the longer-term recovery. Um, so short-term operations, that would include things like restoring utility services, uh, perhaps clearing debris away to reestablish transportation routes, and also providing food and shelter to anybody from the community who's displaced. Your recovery planning can actually be used to build your stakeholder partnerships across the whole community. Um, so because you're focusing on how you're going to restore the community, so that's a perfect time for community engagement. The recovery plans need to address um, you know, mutual aid agreements, uh, regional compacts, pre-written emergency ordinances perhaps um, that will help you facilitate recovery operations. Uh, you might want to have to be able to close a road quickly or expedite permitting um, so that contractors can get on the site. You wanna focus on continuity of government operations um, and then some strategies for including civic leaders and the public in any type of recovery decision-making process. So you want to involve the community because that actually helps you better deal with um, response and recovery. So you also have to look at the planning environment. Uh, all levels of government have to coordinate their plans vertically to ensure that there's sort of a single operational focus, focus on the emergency. The goal of that is to ensure effectiveness. You've got these combined federal, state, and local operations, and you want them to be in sync. And so to increase collaboration amongst governments, we have uh, a national incident management system that kind of provides the framework for incident management, um, and it creates the incident command system, which is you know, used to manage all of our domestic response operations. We also have the National Response Framework, or NRF, that defines specific roles and responsibilities um, for all levels of the government, also for NGOs, other organizations, and even individuals. Um, recall back in week five, we discussed that FEMA wasn't prepared for Hurricane Katrina. And in that situation, nobody knew what triggered uh, what was at the time called the National Response Plan. Um, you know, it was supposed to deal with incidents of national significance, but that didn't wasn't defined. Uh, Homeland Security at the federal level didn't have any way to trigger the response. And as a result, the federal government was just ill prepared to respond to Hurricane Katrina. And lessons learned from that actually led the feds to create the national response framework. And that's got guiding principles of engaged partnership, tiered response, scalable, flexible, adaptable responses, unified command, and a readiness to act. Um, and then in addition, we've got state and local emergency operation plans that describe you know, exactly how 
state, territorial, tribal, and local governments are going to respond to, you know, have the initial response uh, to any type of emergency. The initial response to a serious emergency is often to trigger the continuity of operations plan. So let's talk briefly about that type of plan. There are many templates available to emergency planners, um, but particularly at local levels, it's really important for agencies to own their own continuity of operations plans. And that's because each agency's operations are distinct. So creating your own plan makes you aware of all of the different circumstances that apply specifically to your geographic location, your community makeup, et cetera. So these continuity of operations plans should highlight the plan's purpose and applicability. You know, it should clearly indicate that what it's trying to do is maintain critical services during emergencies. You know, these are not day-to-day -day operations plans. The plan should also describe to whom and to what it applies, under what circumstances, and with what limitations. It should provide a list of legal references, you know, the local ordinances, state statutes, um, and federal statutes that affect the government emergency and continuity planning. You know, and these are things like uh, state emergency management acts. It should also identify essential functions. You know, every continuity of operations plan needs to delineate the agency's essential functions, services, and other activities. Um, and it also needs to identify the personnel, the facilities, and any other resources that are required to carry out those functions or services. The plan should delegate authority to carry out essential functions. Um, you know, the authority to make decisions in an emergency, that should be clear. It should also comply with state law. Um, continuity of operations plans should also be clear about limitations on that legal authority. You know, what are the boundaries of that authority? If there's a chance that key personnel could be lost in responding to an emergency and, you know, to be on the safe side, I would assume there's always that chance. The continuity of operations plan should also indicate how to quickly replace key personnel um, if they're no longer able to carry out their functions. It should include a communications plan to make sure that decision makers are appropriately providing direction to frontline personnel and the public, and also to ensure that those frontline personnel can provide feedback to decision makers as the situation on the ground changes. Uh, the plan should address how to protect things like vital records and data, how to keep your IT systems um, up and running and also designate an alternate facility that the agency can use to carry out operations and reestablish critical functions if for some reason the primary facility is lost. Finally, the continuity of operations plan should incorporate the National Incident Management System and the Incident Command System. You know, the uh, Incident Command System, that describes the structure for command and control of the emergency and it should be used as soon as that continuity of operations plan is activated. You know, tasks, roles, and various responsibilities um, for things like evacuations or quarantines, they all flow from that structure. In addition to risk assessments and planning, emergency preparedness also encompasses training and exercises. Uh, the TV show Parks and Rec had a really good episode. I mean, they're all good episodes, but this one was called Emergency Response, um, where the Indiana Department of Emergency Preparedness surprised the city, the city of Pawnee with an emergency drill. So it was a city government-wide operations-based exercise, you know, to see how the city was going to respond to an outbreak of avian flu. Leslie Nope, of course, had a real thick binder, the Nope Protocol, that is basically all hazards management on serious steroids. You know, it covers everything, it covered every possible action the city could take. It included things like DVDs. And yet it gets a nope from me. And that's because the best, most thoughtful plans will fail if people don't read, understand, and remember them. So if people aren't gonna read and follow your plan, then in the end, it's just not a very good plan. Uh, you also have to be able to communicate that plan to the general public, and that brings us to a discussion of risk communication. 
Risk communication is an essential part of preparedness. Um, it is the exchange of real-time information, advice, and opinions between experts and the people who are facing threats to their health, to the economy, to the environment, any type of risk. Risk communication helps people make good decisions to protect themselves and their loved ones. Um, it can also be used to raise awareness to encourage the public to engage in protective behavior, such as wearing masks during a pandemic. Um, and it can be used to build up the public's understanding of what to do and also why. You know, for instance, people should understand that wearing non-surgical masks in public, that's for the benefit of others. You know, no matter how careful we are, there are times when we all spray it rather than say it. So having a mask, that keeps you from spraying others. And that's good, you know, we want to encourage people to protect others, but at the same time, we don't want people to get a false sense of security from a non-surgical mask. Um, we want everybody to maintain social distancing or physical distancing and good hygiene. So while issuing warnings is part of risk communication, it's better to have proactive risk communication. You want to talk to the community in advance of an emergency. You want to listen to the community's concerns, you know, build trust, uh, build cooperation, and build networks, all of which are crucial when you actually have to respond to an emergency. Now, risk communication requires a real understanding of other people. And that would be all other people, you know, not just the ones who make up the majority of your community, not just the ones who look like you or live near you. Risk communication, it uses a lot of different communication techniques uh, that can range from traditional media and social media communications um, to mass communications through emergency alert systems to community engagement. And governments should shape those communications in order to gain the trust of local communities. You know, in order to do this, a good risk communicator has to understand and also show the community that they understand that community's perceptions, concerns, beliefs, and practices. You know, so a good risk communicator is gonna show expertise. Uh, they know what they're talking about. They know how to fix the problem and other known experts agree with them. They also have to show good character. You know, if the community believes that you're telling the truth and that you're not omitting unfavorable information, the community will feel that you are reliable um, and that you understand and, and you share the values and experiences of the community. Some forms of risk communication can be pretty amusing. The CDC has issued various uh, warnings not to kiss your pet turtles, your pet hedgehogs, or your pet chickens. But risk communication faces really major challenges in today's world, especially the challenge of misinformation or disinformation. So risk communicators, they've got to be able to identify and manage rumors and other types of misinformation early on before they have a chance to take hold in the public psyche. You know, we saw that last year with measles outbreaks uh, in the U.S. and Israel. We're seeing it now in response to COVID-19. There are tweets and Facebook posts um, and email forwards that are spreading misinformation and disinformation. And they've gone so viral that we've had local law enforcement and federal agencies have to step in and issue a public response to combat that false information. And Unlike our you know, sort of now standard news cycles of political disinformation, COVID-19 misinformation and disinformation has hit all along the political spectrum. Um, and in large part, this is because a lot of the misleading and even false information is being spread by well-meaning people who are really trying to help, but they just don't have many facts to rely on. So COVID-19, has kind of created this perfect storm of misinformation because so many people are frantically searching for answers, um, mostly online, because that's what we do now. And while some factual information is available, you know, we just don't have enough data yet. So this brings us back to the whole idea of scientific uncertainty. And when there's a vacuum of evidence, you know, that is when misinformation can flow in.
In the past 10 years, we've also seen major shifts in how we, the public, communicate with each other, with organizations, and with our governments. And this has led to new challenges for those involved in risk communication. The ways in which the public seeks health advice in particular, that has shifted to online sources and social networks, you know, rather than doctors, public officials, and other experts. Um, our 24-hour news media model has led to a reduction in resources, um, an increase in what we'll call citizenship journalism, uh, which would include you know, social media, and also the rise of opinion reporting versus the better sourced news stories um, that we were more used to in the past. Now, there are some benefits to breaking this old model of, you know, here's the news brought to you by one of the big three network television stations. But unfortunately, it has also led to an environment where experts and authorities are less trusted. And that issue of trust, be it real or perceived, is central to risk communications, especially to health communications. You know, facts are just no longer enough to convince people of a risk. Instead, perception and trust are intertwined, and a 10-second soundbite has a much broader impact than a piece of well-supported investigative journalism or an interview with a leading expert. And again, we see these challenges right now during the COVID-19 pandemic and its accompanying epidemic of misinformation and disinformation. And in addition to well-meaning but factually inaccurate people who are spreading misinformation, the shifts in the way that we consume news have opened the doors for scammers uh, who thrive in uncertain times and also for foreign governments or other groups that seek to interfere with our security, prosperity, and reputation on the world stage. So there's misinformation, which is just factually inaccurate, um, and then there is disinformation, which is intentionally harmful, uh, sort of like propaganda pieces. However, it's also important to understand that one size does not fit all. The key difficulty with approaches to risk communication, uh, particularly in the US, um, is that A, we've lost trust in government, but also the government keeps pushing a single message, hoping that you know eventually the 2000th time they say it, it's going to break through and make a difference in communities. But the lack of trust in government means that the government is not always the best one to reach out to communities with a message of preparedness. And government personnel also need to recognize the cultural differences in communications. Um, so for example, government officials have had a hard time working with certain indigenous tribes in Alaska um, until they realized that the tribal customs basically prohibited a government person from speaking first. You had to let a tribal elder speak first. And once they realized that that is the way communication had to flow, they were able to do a better job. Now, there are government efforts like ready.gov. Yes, these are important sources of information, but only if people actually use them. You know, and these sites generally don't make a big impact on the public um, because the, the sites aren't understanding and articulating the needs and identities of communities. You know, they're generalizing the message, so it's not resonating. And this is where we need to um, develop what we call culture brokers. You know, these are people who understand the community and its needs. They understand what's already being done um, in the community to develop preparedness, and they can kind of tag onto that. Um, and so emergency managers can actually facilitate community preparedness through culture brokers. So culture brokers uh, should be local residents or people who are locally embedded in the community. Um, people with, you know, they've got a foot in two or more worlds. They're used to working inside the community, but they're also used to working externally with larger organizations. So they can help navigate the gaps that are uh, between the cultural group and community and the organizations that want to help that community prepare for disaster or recover from disaster. Um, so one of the examples is the CDC's Cut for Life Hairstylists and Barbers Against AIDS program. The CDC was realizing 
uh, that in part because there there was sort of this disinformation that the federal government was spreading AIDS through uh, HIV AIDS through black communities. Um, so the CDC realized, well, having government officials reach out isn't really going to do all of that much. What we need to do is find the heart of the community and convince those people who live and work there to reach out and to spread correct information. And that's what Cut for Life does. Um, you know, people go to the barber shop or the salon and their stylists or barbers actually have been trained in risk communication, um, you know, by the CDC and by NGOs, but they are able to disseminate that information in a way that they know is going to resonate within their community. So that is the importance of having culture brokers in your risk communications, which is part of your emergency preparedness. I want to stress again that planning, it's only effective if people understand the plan, accept the plan as an appropriate response under the circumstances, and then carry through and implement it. There's just no amount of planning or foresight that is going to help if the government and the public don't take the steps necessary to support and implement those plans. Um, and, you know, this really is a message that's all too timely given our current pandemic. You know, at the time of uh, this lecture, the time I prepared it, we've got 1.5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 81,000 deaths worldwide. You know, over 4,000 of those deaths were in New York City alone. And as a comparison, during the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, New York City lost 2,753 people. You know, now it's lost over 4,000. In 2017, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued an update to its pandemic influenza plan. And then in 2018, the CDC gave a presentation for the 100th anniversary of the 1918 Spanish flu. That presentation was subtitled, Are We Ready for the Next Pandemic? Uh, same year, The Atlantic published a long form journalism piece called The Next Plague is Coming, Is America Ready? The answer from both the CDC and the Atlantic um, to the question of whether or not we are ready is no, absolutely not. You know, the Atlantic article and the CDC presentation made it pretty clear nearly two years ago that we were simply not ready for a pandemic. And yet, even with that expert foresight, we still didn't properly prepare. You know, the Atlantic article referred to the U.S. as disturbingly vulnerable to a pandemic. And in part, that's because we rely on these just-in-time supply chains, which means that we just don't have a reserve of medical supplies. That article also noted that the hospital preparedness program and the public health emergency preparedness program, both created to help hospitals and health departments prepare for disasters through training and building capacity, those programs saw their budgets and personnel cut back drastically over the past 10 years. Now, in part, we weren't prepared because COVID-19 is not the flu. Um, you know, I think if we had been dealing with a flu pandemic, we would be better off. And that's because the U.S. has a robust infrastructure for making flu vaccines and getting them out into the right hands, you know, getting the public vaccinated. But influenza is not the same as coronavirus. And what works for the flu is not working for COVID-19. That said, the excuse that we are not prepared because it's not the flu really only goes so far because in all hazards management the government should have a plan for every probable infectious disease outbreak epidemic or pandemic and sadly here in the u.s we have just failed to make consistent investments in our pandemic preparedness this is really especially unfortunate because even in the best of times it's difficult to organize a federal response to an emerging pandemic um, you know, in the past, President Obama was pretty successful in the response to the Ebola outbreaks in 2014. In part, that's because he appointed an Ebola czar, so like one person to coordinate the response across many different agencies, even where those agencies had unclear or conflicting responsibilities. So Obama did a pretty good job with Ebola, but he wasn't able to spearhead a particularly successful response to the Zika virus, um, you know, in part due to sort of this partisan politicking in Congress. 
And our federal government has been even less effective now because many civil servants, including a lot of scientists, have left the government. And that leads to an even greater lack of institutional knowledge and capacity to respond. Okay, so we're gonna move on from preparation to the actual response. But first, just so you don't forget, response planning is actually part of your preparation. And the better your response plan, uh, the more rapidly you can actually implement your recovery operations. So the immediate recovery operations are going to be actions that um, you know, sustain lives, save lives, meet basic human needs, so food, water, shelter, and also reduce any loss. Um, so that's loss of life, loss of property, um, loss of critical infrastructure, loss of environmental resources. So that's what agencies will focus on you know, during the immediate response. You also have to focus on the psychological and social effects of a disaster. And you've gotta be aware that you might have cascading disasters. Um, so a threat might not exist in isolation. You know, you can have a hurricane that leads to flooding. The flooding will lead to a dam failure. You know, those are all cascading disasters. And that's why the National Response Framework actually looks at core capabilities that you can apply to those cascading effects. Um, and that's gotta be able to be applied quickly, which is why you wanna be flexible. Um, so as an example of a cascading disaster, um, a couple of years ago in Japan, the Fukushima nuclear plant uh, went into a meltdown. So there had been an earthquake, but that is not what caused the meltdown. Um, you know, there was the earthquake and the Fukushima nuclear plant automatically shut down some of their fission reactions. So they were prepared for the earthquake. What they weren't prepared for was the tsunami that was generated by the earthquake. And that knocked out all of the emergency generators that provided power to control and operate the pumps that were cooling the reactors. And it was that insufficient cooling that actually led to the nuclear meltdown, um, also to explosions and the release of radioactive materials. So that's a cascading disaster. Um, and that's why it's so important to have a scalable response uh, and the ability to rapidly switch from one incident to the next. Not in all circumstances, but certainly you should be prepared for it. So like I said, all incidents are different. Um, you know, scope, severity, duration, what actually caused the incident, those are major factors. But the effects tend to be the same. You need to warn the public. You might need to rescue or evacuate people need to shelter people, attend to their medical needs, uh, generally protect the population. So here you can actually see the response and recovery phase. Um, and you can see that the disaster itself is really a short time frame. And then you've got your short-term response, your intermediate response, and then your long-term response, which can stretch on for years. But during the short term, you've got to provide emergency functions uh, such as firefighting, police, rescue, engineering, communications, evacuation, um, all of that. So let's go back to the Stafford Act, uh, which authorizes the federal government to respond to emergencies. So as we discussed earlier, um, the Stafford Act authorizes the president to basically task federal agencies and have them render assistance to states uh, during disasters or other emergencies. Uh, so it authorizes the president to establish the disaster preparedness program. It requires uh, that states have a warning system, um, sets requirements for mitigation plans, and then creates the procedures through which you can trigger uh, a disaster or an emergency declaration. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, the Stafford Act was amended after Hurricane Katrina um, by the Disaster Management Act because the feds realized that they actually needed to expand the scope of assistance um, to state and local governments. And then also the Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standards Act because the federal government recognized um, after Katrina that, you know, people aren't going to abandon their pets like they'll abandon their lawnmower. 
You know, people were refusing to evacuate if they couldn't take their pets with them. And so the federal government had to change its response, um, you know, to sort of really deal with that cultural shift where we now think of pets as family. So the Stafford Act provides federal assistance to the states if the president declares a major disaster or an emergency. Um, the president can only declare a major disaster upon request of the state governor or a tribal leader. The president can issue the emergency declaration um, either at the request of a governor uh, or tribal leader, but the president can also declare an emergency on his or her own. Uh, this has happened twice as a result of terrorist attacks. Uh, the April 1995 bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, um, and then the September 11th attack on the Pentagon. In both of those instances, there was no request for an emergency declaration. The president just went ahead and made it. So the Stafford Act includes some very important definitions. So it defines a major disaster as a natural catastrophe or regardless of cause, so it could be man-made, a fire, flood, or explosion. And it's got to be of you know, sufficient severity and magnitude to warrant major disaster assistance. There also has to be an unmet need. The incident cost has to be beyond the capacity of the state and local governments. So FEMA actually assesses damage costs. I meet with the state um, to assess the costs of damage to homes and public infrastructure. Um, it's the damage to public infrastructure that can be particularly important because that, you know, FEMA basically looks at, you know, what's the cost of damage to infrastructure compared to the state population? Um, and then it determines whether or not there's a sufficient unmet, unmet need to trigger federal assistance. Uh, so here's a look at the criteria required for the president to declare a major disaster. Um, you know, the disaster's got to meet the Stafford Act definition of a disaster. It has to have overwhelmed state and local capabilities, and the state has to have implemented um, its emergency operation plans. And then if FEMA finds, you know, that, um, that the disaster is just so severe, the magnitude is too extreme for local response, then the federal government will go ahead and render assistance. That assistance generally takes three forms, public assistance, individual assistance, and hazard mitigation assistance. So public assistance, um, it focuses on repairing damage to infrastructure like public roads and buildings. Um, individual assistance helps families and individuals. Uh, it can be temporary housing or it could be grants to address any type of a post-disaster need, um, such as replacing your personal property or rebuilding your house. Um, also could involve crisis counseling, uh, disaster unemployment benefits, things like that. Um, and then there's the hazard mitigation assistance that provides grant funding to the states for various mitigation projects. So FEMA coordinates all of this um, to make sure that relevant agencies are addressing a state's request for federal assistance. So that's the major disaster declaration. There's also the emergency declaration. Um, so here's the definition of that. We've got any occasion or instance for which the president determines uh, that federal assistance is needed to supplement state and local efforts to save lives, protect property, protect health and safety, or lessen or avert the threat of a catastrophe. There also needs to be an unmet need here. So this is very similar um, to what you have to do to get a major disaster declaration. It's the assistance that's different. So FEMA still provides assistance uh, for an emergency declaration, but not as much as it would during a major disaster. Um, so primarily, FEMA is gonna provide emergency services, uh, other services to prevent an emergency from turning into a disaster, but it's not gonna provide assistance for repairs um, to public infrastructure or anything like that. Here is the emergency declaration criteria, um, again, fairly similar to the major disaster criteria. 
I also want to talk a bit about mutual aid agreements as they are a key part of emergency management and response. Um, so no single jurisdiction is going to have all of the personnel and equipment and materials required to respond to a major emergency or a disaster. And so these mutual aid agreements um, provide a way to obtain resources uh, from neighboring jurisdictions that were not impacted by the emergency. So they are a really essential component of planning response and recovery activities. Um, having a mutual aid agreement in place, it, it really significantly increases the availability of resources, um, and these have been shown to improve response and recovery efforts. It's also important you know, for local government to make sure that their local recovery plans um, contain adequate provisions for you know, rendering and receipt of mutual aid. So these agreements are mandated by a number of different standards, um, including the NFP. PA 1600 standard and the um, and NIMS at the federal level. And, you know, they just allow multiplication of resources. So they are critical, but they do raise some areas of legal concern, um, primarily about governmental rights and liabilities. So, for example, you know, you've got one jurisdiction, it agrees to augment another jurisdiction's response capabilities under the terms of this agreement. Well, to what extent is um, you know, the jurisdiction that's not experiencing the emergency, you know, are they protected from liability? Um, you know, can they issue emergency evacuation orders? So these are the questions that come up. So you address most of these questions by having a good mutual aid agreement. Um, I've got the list on here about what you should have in a mutual aid agreement. It's actually good to have in uh, most of these are good to have in all legal agreements, um, but you really want to sort of establish your rights and responsibilities and the protection from liability. So this is where interstate compacts come in. Um, interstate compacts are themselves mutual aid agreements, and we actually have compacts on many topics, including pr uh, crime prevention, child custody, higher education, uh, things like that. Emergencies can transcend political boundaries very quickly. And so that is why we have an emergency management assistance compact. It exists to provide state to state um, assistance in the event of an emergency. The National Emergency Management Association, NEMA, is a 501c3 um, professional association of emergency management directors. It's got the directors from all 50 states, uh, eight US territories, plus the District of Columbia and it manages the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. So every state and every US territory plus DC has ratified EMAC. So this compact is actually legally binding on all of, um, all of the states. It provides for mutual cooperation in emergency related exercises, testing, training activities, um, and then also in actual emergencies itself. Um, it can also include the use of the state uh, National Guard forces. Uh, you can do that uh, through the National Guard Mutual Assistance Compact, because of course there's one for that too. But it's also an agreement between state governments that if one state is providing emergency services and personnel to another state, the state that's assisting has all the same powers and duties and rights and privileges that are afforded to the state that is receiving the assistance. Um, and so what that means is you're considered agents of the state that are receiving the assistance. Um, so even though, for instance, you might work in Colorado and you're responding to an emergency in New Mexico, well, you have the same protection that New Mexico uh, personnel have. So you get protection from liability, um, EMAC also provides for things like reimbursement of expenses and then compensation, uh, things like workers' compensation, um, as well as death benefits if the employees of one state are, are injured and killed responding and helping out another state. Since we're in the midst of it, let's take a look at the unfolding federal government response to our COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it has unfortunately been a fragmented and chaotic response. 
when the coronavirus first gained notice in December, President Trump, members of Congress, um, they were still distracted by impeachment. You know, the House of Representatives impeached Trump on December 18th, 2019. That was just shortly before Chinese authorities uh, admitted to responding to a new virus in the city of Wuhan. But even so, you know, by early January, the federal government was on notice about the serious nature of the coronavirus and yet didn't even adopt a response plan until mid-March. Even after that, the government's communications to the public, to state governors, to other officials, it's been unclear at best. And that poor communication has been exacerbated by the general lack of trust in the federal government's ability to respond. Um, I try to not be political in a lot of these lectures, um, and I actually don't necessarily think it's a political statement that I'm about to make, but we've got a president who, from what I can tell, doesn't understand or care to understand how the government works. You know, he doesn't trust career civil servants. He's not been able to keep um, high-level officials in place in a wide variety of federal agencies. Um, so Trump is just particularly ill-suited to respond to a pandemic. Um, I think pretty much anybody else, including Mike Pence, if he were the president, would be doing a much better job. So I want to talk a little bit about this inability to keep high-level officials in place. Um, under the Trump administration, a lot of agencies, including cabinet-level agencies, they have been headed up by acting directors and acting secretaries. So for instance, under Trump, the Department of Homeland Security has been led by three different acting secretaries. Um, it still doesn't even have a nominee for permanent position. Homeland Security has not had a permanent secretary uh, since April 10th of 2019, so that's almost a year now. At Homeland Security, only about a third um, of the top positions are filled with permanent officials. Homeland Security's got no Senate confirmed chief of staff, uh, no executive secretary or deputy secretary, no Senate confirmed general counsel or undersecretary for management, uh, undersecretary for science and technology, CFO, or even a chief information officer. Um, additionally, in Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they don't have Senate confirmed leaders. FEMA lacks a Senate confirmed official uh, for its deputy roles, including the deputy who is in charge of overseeing prepper, um, I'm sorry, preparedness and continuity of government operations. FEMA is also operating without the advice of a permanent chief medical advisor because that position in Homeland Security is also vacant, um, Homeland Security and also HHS. On the intelligence side, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence um, has not had a Senate confirmed director for eight months. Now, it's not unusual to have acting officials. All presidential administrations have acting officials at times, um, but the Trump administration has been really extreme in its inability to fill important vacancies at the very agencies that are supposed to be providing a vigorous response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the problem with acting officials is that by their very nature, they are temporary. You know, they don't have authority to set or implement policies. Uh, they usually don't even have time to learn the ropes of their agency. They're limited by statute to a 220 day period, at which point they just become senior officials and have even less clout than they do as an acting director. Additionally, many of the acting officials that we have seen cycle through the Trump administration have limited experience in the agencies that they have tried to lead. Um, as an example, our current acting director of national intelligence, this is the nation's top intelligence advisor. He's a former ambassador and he's got the least amount of intelligence experience of anybody who has ever held this position. Um, on top of that, he doesn't have any experience running an agency. So unfortunately, we find ourselves in a situation where Americans are frightened and vulnerable and our state governments are overwhelmed, and yet the federal government has not been able to effectively step in and respond to the crisis. So instead, we are stuck with a patchwork of 50 state responses and hundreds of city, county, and territorial responses without the coordination that is really necessary 
to respond to a pandemic that is threatening hundreds of thousands of American lives, as well as our economy. You know, if you run through a timeline of the federal government's response, you'll see that we have wasted months of precious time that we should have been using to protect American lives, work on a vaccine, and protect the economy. Although the first reports of the coronavirus emerged in December 2019, uh, the CDC received formal notification of the virus on January 3rd. And all throughout early January, U.S. intelligence agencies were providing warning after warning. Um, Health and Human Services began assembling an interagency task force, including uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is really the opposite of an acting official because he's been serving as the director of our National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. So it's not that we were unaware, you know, intelligence agencies and even HHS were working on this um, in early January. On January 8th, the CDC issued its first public alert about COVID-19. But the Secretary of Health and Human Services wasn't even able to talk to the president until 10 days later on January 18th. Um, and at that point, you know, he said the president was more interested in talking about vaping and not coronavirus. Um, on January 21st, we saw the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the United States. And by January 23rd, Health and Human Services Secretary was urging the National Security Council to take control of the COVID-19 response. Even so, on January 25th, President Trump announced that, you know, the U.S. had the virus, quote, totally under control. Um, and that was, you know, only to have the HHS secretary declare a public emergency less than a week later. In early February, the Trump administration finally took some action to prohibit people who had recently been in China from entering the U.S., um, but that was a pretty minor step. Uh, it was only people who had been in certain areas of China in the last 14 days. So a lot of people were still able to come in. And we know now that uh, the COVID-19 incubation period can be fairly long and you can have uh, the virus while being asymptomatic. Uh, early February, the Trump administration also tapped the emergency fund that we have to respond to infectious disease outbreaks. Um, but that fund is only $105 million. Uh, additionally, the national stockpile of personal protective gear, so things like masks and gloves for medical responders, both of those proved insufficient to say the least. Although the Secretary of HHS submitted a funding request to the White House Office of Management and Budget on February 5th um, to respond to COVID-19, that request went nowhere and no funding materialized um, until the first coronavirus law was uh, signed on March 6th. So the federal government lost an entire month when it should have been stockpiling emergency equipment, personal protective gear, ventilators, things like that. Instead, you know, by the time the feds took action, they had to bid against state governments and foreign nations to get these critical supplies. But that's March, let's go back to February. Um, on February 8th, the CDC's COVID-19 test was shown to be untrustworthy. Uh, it was not giving appropriate responses, and yet it remained in use for 21 days because the FDA refused to allow academic um, and clinical research labs to create and use their own tests. Now, by mid-February, many mayors and state governors were already responding to the spreading pandemic. You know, they were encouraging and then requiring residents to engage in social distancing uh, or to stay at home. Yet Trump kept tweeting that everything was fine. Uh, you know, as late as February 25th, he again said that the coronavirus was very much under control. It wasn't until the very last day of February, um, and that's in a leap year, so that's one extra day even than usual, that the FDA finally decided to let clinical labs begin testing for COVID-19. Um, on that same day, the U.S. saw its first death from COVID-19. The first truly coordinated federal response we saw was when Congress passed and President Trump signed the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act on March 6th. 
So that law provided over $8 billion in emergency funding for research and development of vaccines, uh, for medical supplies, and to support state and local agencies in their preparedness and response activities. On March 11th, uh, Trump halted incoming travel from Europe, which was something that the deputy national security advisor had been asking him to do for weeks. But again, think about communication. You know, that announcement created confusion about whether Americans could return home, um, about whether international shipping would stop. Uh, one day later, the Federal Public Health Service acknowledged that the government should have moved much faster to detect and contain the virus. You know, Dr. Fauci admitted that there were, I'm quoting here, deep structural problems in the nation's public health system. Uh, a day after that, on March 13th, Trump invoked Stafford Act authority. Um, and the New York Times published the U.S. government's COVID-19 response plan. So that plan describes how agencies should coordinate. Um, it also urged some actions that had already been taken at the state and local levels, like closing schools and canceling large events. Uh, the government's response plan did warn that the pandemic could last 18 months or longer, uh, could include multiple waves of infection, and noted that state and local governments um, and also critical infrastructure and communications channels were gonna be overwhelmed and potentially unreliable. On March 16th, three days after the US government uh, issued its COVID-19 response plan, the Office of the President finally issued coronavirus guidance, you know, telling the public to avoid social gatherings, practice good hygiene, basically stay home as much as possible. Finally, on March 20th, Trump approved the first of many disaster declarations, um, this one for the state of New York, and yet, you know, really frustratingly, especially for public health officials, just four days after that, Trump proclaimed that he wanted the U.S. open for business by Easter, uh, which is April 12th. You know, in late March, the feds finally ordered, you know, 10,000 ventilators. Um, Trump bent to pressure from across the political spectrum and invoked the Defense Production Act to ramp up uh, corporate, you know, industrial production of supplies and equipment to combat the pandemic. But it wasn't until early April that the CDC told Americans to wear face masks when out in public, even though this is a protective measure that is widely in use elsewhere in the world. Um, and as of this lecture, we still do not have a national stay at home order, um, although most states have issued them. Um, and as of this lecture, we are not entirely sure about what's going to happen next at the federal level. It is good that states have been responding to COVID-19. States and localities can have the most immediate impact on behavior. Um, and that's because it's state governors, not the federal government, who have the authority to do things like shut down stores and restaurants. Um, additionally, state and local governments employ most of the public health workers who are on the front lines in response to COVID-19. A lot of counties and cities issued their own stay-at-home orders early on in the pandemic, uh, some as early as mid-February. Some state governors, uh, such as Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom in California and Republican Governor Larry Hogan in Maryland, also took action really early, you know, first focusing on voluntary compliance with social distancing guidance, um, and then moving on to stay-at-home orders. So currently, uh, well over 300 million people in at least 41 states, um, plus additional counties, cities, D.C., and Puerto Rico, are being urged to stay home. And according to Dr. Fauci, who is, again, our nation's you know, leading infectious disease expert, areas of the country that reduced travel quickly and asked people to stay home are already seeing some benefits. Um, that even includes New York which is currently the epicenter of the pandemic in the US, but had New York not imposed really strict measures early on, the situation would be far worse than it is now. And I mean, right now it's bad. Um, to think that it could be even worse is almost unimaginable. So control measures, uh, they typically take two to three weeks to show any effect. And that's because of the amount of time that it takes for infected people to develop symptoms, uh, seek medical care, 
get tested, although our testing still really lags behind, um, and I'm quite disappointed that we're not doing widespread testing. Um, I've actually got a couple of colleagues whose children have fallen ill with uh, COVID-19-like symptoms. Only one of them has been able to get a test. That test was a week ago, and the results are still not in. But anyway, in areas where public officials resisted or delayed implementing stay-at-home orders, you know, people changed their habits far less. And we are really seeing the impact of that now, you know, especially in the Southeast. Florida, for instance, you know, it waited so long to shut down travel and close the beaches that it's going to struggle to control outbreaks, even if everybody in Florida right now, this very moment, significantly changed their behavior and just stayed home. Um, the image on the screen, that is provided by the New York Times uh, on April 2nd. You can see that in the Northeast, Upper Midwest, and the West Coast, people really did drastically limit their travel. You know, people went from traveling an average of 16 miles a day to less than one mile. We can also compare the different state responses. When I prepared this lecture over the weekend, California, Rhode Island, Maryland, New Hampshire, and New Jersey had implemented the most aggressive responses to COVID-19, while Mississippi, Nevada, Tennessee, Idaho, and Arkansas did not. Um, but you know, things are changing quickly on both ends of the spectrum. So you can see in this particular graphic, the length of time that it took for some states to declare a state of emergency, to limit the size of public gatherings, uh, close public schools, restrict restaurant operations, and issue stay at home or shelter in place orders. Um, as of April 7th, uh, North Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Arkansas are the only states where nobody is under a stay at home order. A discussion of different state responses and outcomes in Kentucky and Tennessee, which share a very long border, um, this began making the rounds on social media in late March. Uh, when a Lexington, Kentucky resident uh, named Stephanie Jolly, she's got a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in food science, she decided to plot the early days of the outbreak and she shared her graph. So on March 25th, the Tennessee Department of Health confirmed that it had uh, just over 1,200 cases of coronavirus in the state. In Kentucky, uh, they had 302 positive tests for COVID-19. Um, so that's a fourth, 25% of the total cases in Tennessee. And Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir actually called out Tennessee um, while talking about states that were you know, lacking the same restrictions and commitment to combating the pandemic uh, as Kentucky. There's some new research from the University of Tennessee that suggests that there are multiple reasons, um, including the state level response for the disparity in confirmed cases in these two states. Tennessee is nearly 33% larger than Kentucky. Um, it also has a greater population density and a greater urban population. There has been a higher rate of testing in Tennessee. Um, so you know of more cases, the more testing that you do. But Tennessee was also slower to issue statewide guidance. You know, Kentucky declared a state of emergency on March 6th. Tennessee didn't do that until March 12th. Kentucky started closing facilities on March 10th. Um, it closed schools on March 11th and advised that all social gatherings be canceled. Tennessee did not close schools until March 20th. That was the same day that Kentucky closed in-person dining at bars and restaurants, and it waived the waiting period for unemployment. So the rate of infection remained relatively equal between those two states until March 16th, and then Tennessee really began to see a quicker rise in cases. Um, according to the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, as of April 3rd, at least 35 states, plus Washington, D.C., Guam, and Puerto Rico, had introduced legislation to support state action related to COVID-19. Uh, several states um, adjourned their legislative sessions early or adopted temporary rules that allowed the legislature and other governing bodies to meet and vote electronically. Um, states appropriated funds 
or focused on health topics such as insurance coverage, medical costs, or telehealth services. Still others uh, passed laws um, involving paid leave, unemployment benefits, guidance for schools, uh, workforce protections for people who are in quarantine. And then there are also laws that address price gouging or eligibility for public services, um, or even temporarily prohibit evictions, um, prohibit utility services from being shut off, and extend certain legal deadlines like filing your taxes. All right, let's move on to the recovery phase, which I very much hope that we will enter soon, um, although I have a feeling that we will be dealing with this pandemic uh, for quite a while. So recovery is a phase that encompasses both short-term and long-term efforts for rebuilding and revitalizing affected communities. You know, recall that earlier I noted that Americans are just not prepared for emergencies. Um, and that also means that we are not prepared to recover from those emergencies. You know, even simple things become really magnified during and immediately after a disaster. Um, as an example, Americans used to have a lot more landlines for telephones. Landlines don't require electricity to work. Uh, they do require that the phone lines are still up, but the power could be out. I remember I was in Washington, D.C. Um, during the terrorist attacks of September 11th, and it was almost impossible to make a cell phone call in the DC area. You know, so many people were trying to reach loved ones that the cellular networks, they just could not handle the increased capacity. So a lot of these calls were not going through, but the landlines were still working. We are also not prepared to take a hard look at environmental factors in rebuilding, um, particularly as areas of the country that are prone to flooding and hurricanes. Typically what we do is just weather the storm and rebuild without giving a lot of thought as to whether or not we should really be rebuilding in those areas because it's almost, almost positive that there's gonna be another disaster. Um, we're not really prepared to think of uh, changing our zoning ordinances or, or taking other steps to possibly mitigate the impact of a future disaster. Another issue people don't tend to consider is consumer protection in the aftermath of a disaster or other emergency. Um, immediately after any disaster, you know, there are insurance adjusters, contractors, and their salespeople out and about offering services. Uh, that can be anything from handling insurance claims to securing abandoned property to providing water and mold remediation services. Now, many times, these people are providing a valuable service you know, to the community. Um, communities trying to recover, these folks are helping. But they don't always have the public interest in mind. You know, scammers of all sorts really thrive during and after disasters, um, and that's because people are panicked, scared, looking for some type of reassurance and control. And we are seeing that now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the FTC and other federal and state agencies, including law enforcement agencies, they are doing their best to help people avoid coronavirus scams, you know, particularly scams that would defraud people or create further risk to the public health. So recovery does need to focus on appropriate preparation you know, for the emergency, but then it also should focus on appropriate community engagement to recover after the emergency is over. Recovery long term should include an after action report. Um, so back in week five, we talked about FEMA's for, uh, poor performance, excuse me, during Hurricane Maria. So that hit Puerto Rico mid September 2017, and it was the third major hurricane to strike within a month. So FEMA was already preoccupied uh, with storm emergencies. It was also preoccupied with uh, wildfires, you know, so it didn't have the capacity to handle triple, quadruple disasters. It also faced certain challenges, um, you know, lack of preparedness in the ground conditions on Puerto Rico, challenges inherent to providing emergency response to an island uh, where you've got to rely on sea and air transport, uh, you know, not trucking, which we often rely upon in the contiguous U.S. So FEMA did not do well, but I also mentioned that FEMA learned 
from its poor response to Hurricane Maria, and it significantly improved its performance, um, and we saw that in Hurricane Florence in 2018. And a lot of the reason for this improvement was because of the after-action report uh, that FEMA engaged in as part of the recovery effort. So that report focused on lack of planning for concurrent emergencies, um, an overwhelmed workforce, and then the issues of responding during long-term infrastructure outages. And now we have you know, a national incident management system that requires corrective action plans, mitigation plans, and all of that that go beyond traditional emergency plans. Um, and that is because of you know, the at, this after action report. So there are so many laws that impact emergency management. Um, you know, we've talked about some, we're going to incredibly briefly touch on others just so that you're aware that they exist. So for instance, there is the Posse Comitus Act, which limits the power of the federal government to use the military for law enforcement purposes. This is why during major disasters, um, governors can ask the president to send in the military, but they are limited in the number of days that they can stay on the ground. There's the Insurrection Act. Um, that was in response to Hurricane Katrina, where there was a lot of looting in New Orleans um, and there wasn't a lot of law enforcement. And so they amended the Insurrection Act to make sure that the president can actually um, you know, require people to disperse, stop looting, um, and send in more law enforcement. There's Things like the Volunteer Protection Act, which, you know, as the name implies, it protects volunteers from liability so that people are willing to volunteer in response to emergencies. There's the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the federal government needs to make sure that its responses uh, are equally effective for people with disabilities. There's the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The federal government's got to make sure that its responses don't discriminate against uh, communities. Um, there are a variety of executive orders, um, mentioned the PETS Act, uh, Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act. You know, this is nowhere near the full list, but you should just be aware that these are federal laws that apply. There are also applicable state laws. Um, all state emergency management laws will share certain characteristics. You know, they set up your emergency management agency, uh, specify, you know, roles in responding to disasters, assign authority to declare states of emergency, things like that. They might also include other specifically enumerated duties for emergency managers. Um, Indiana, for instance, the local emergency manager has to fulfill a variety of duties during all phases of emergency management, uh, including things just like documenting chain of command. There are other state laws that apply, including the common law tort of negligence, which we recently discussed. Uh, that's very important for emergency managers and first responders. There are also procurement laws that govern what you can and can't buy um, and whether or not you can suspend some of these procurement regulations during an emergency. There are privacy laws about what you can and cannot disclose about people. These come into effect when you've got large scale shelter operations. Um, and you're trying to reunite families. There are, in addition, local ordinances, and these are used to kind of fill in the blanks um, that are left by state law. They might specify grants of emergency authority uh, to different local government leaders, um, act as a teaching tool to help government employees understand all of their roles during a disaster, and basically just assure that the local government is taking all of the steps that it can to save lives and to protect property. So we've been talking about legal issues all along, but I really want to reiterate that legal issues, particularly in disaster law, they can run from simple to incredibly complex. Um, and in certain fields, you know, it's pretty likely that the law hasn't quite caught up yet, uh, caught up with developing fields or improved technology and science. However, one thing that you can count on is that the essential nature of an emergency or disaster is that something is going wrong or something is about to go wrong. 
So the best bet for emergency management is to work closely with your legal team prior to an emergency. Make sure that everybody understands the legal responsibilities and liabilities. Um, a lot of these are imposed by law, but some are required by contract. And also to understand standards of care. So even when they're not written into the law, standards of care, like the one that's um, established by NFPA 1600, these are very important in lawsuits because once a professional standard is established, then members of that profession are going to be held to that standard when it comes to liability. Uh, so if you get sued, the courts are going to examine those standards and decide if the individual's behavior fell short, uh, so they were negligent, or if they totally disregarded the standard, um, which would be reckless behavior. And now remember that in tort law, there is no general public duty to rescue, but professional first responders do have a duty to rescue. So that's really important to make sure that everybody understands um, that they can be held liable for a failure to meet that duty. Now, because something always goes wrong in an emergency, um, officials, particularly local officials, often have to choose between a variety of unpleasant options. And those choices are going to lead to more unpleasantness, you know, after the emergency's passed, once the public starts to scrutinize the agency's response um, and unhappy citizens start thinking about lawsuits. So sometimes different groups are going to see the same action as wrong, but for different reasons. And you've got to make these unpleasant choices. Uh, so for instance, if a flood is coming, you know, do you divert your resources to protect a neighborhood that's got higher property values, but fewer homes? Um, so that's likely made up of single family houses, upper middle class people. Or do you protect the neighborhood with a lot of housing, but minimal property value? Either way, one neighborhood is going to be upset that you did not save their homes. Um, evacuation, that's rife with legal challenges. You know, you might have legal authority to declare an evacuation. Um, a lot of times there are state laws that grant the head of a government. Um, so oftentimes the governor, but not necessarily, it could be a mayor, grants the authority to force people to evacuate. And a lot of times, you know, evacuation really is the best proactive step that can be taken, but it's very expensive. It's very disruptive for households and businesses. And a lot of times people just refuse to evacuate. So at that point, you know, you don't have a lot of good options. Um, you can spend vital time trying to convince people to evacuate, but that means that you're not saving other people. You can spend limited resources forcing people to evacuate, basically arresting them and confining them and removing them from the area. But then of course you are risking, you know, a potential suit for false arrest. So again, the best bet is to talk with your legal team before a disaster strikes. Um, that way you can take proactive steps that'll help you avoid having to make unpleasant decisions on the spot. Or at least it'll give you criteria to make those decisions um, which can help protect you in a lawsuit. Operational issues can quickly become legal problems. Um, so this is where the concept of being on notice really comes into play. You know, has your agency not updated its plans in a decade? Um, you know, are personnel routinely complaining that you haven't updated your plans? You know, if so, the agency's on notice that there is a problem. And if an outdated plan keeps the agency from appropriately responding in an emergency, the agency might wind up injuring the very people it is intended to help. And then it also might wind up in court, um, you know, as a result. Emergency managers in particular are liable if they breach their duty to plan, um, you know, or if training isn't conducted or it's conducted poorly or unsafely. If you haven't identified hazards that you should have identified, uh, if warnings weren't given, if people weren't properly following plans and procedures, all of this creates liability. Fortunately, the law does offer emergency personnel and others protection from liability, um, which we call immunity. 
So all states provide immunity for, uh, uh, for state employees who are taking actions in the course of their employment. There are additionally state disaster and emergency statutes that contain more specific immunity provisions. Um, so particularly for government personnel who are engaged in really critical decision-making procedures in an emergency, you want them to be able to make that decision quickly and effectively and without worrying about getting sued later. There are some states um, that actually provide those same immunity provisions to volunteers, uh, be they individuals or organizations. Um, there are Good Samaritan statutes that uh, provide immunity to certain classes of emergency medical responders. Um, so there is immunity, but you definitely need to make sure that your operational issues aren't going to turn into legal issues. You also want to have good, solid legal agreements. You know, you want to protect your interest while collaborating for emergency response. There are three main types of legal agreements. Um, there are contracts, memoranda of understanding, and grants. People don't think that MOUs are contracts, but actually they are. They are just another form of contract. Um, grants are a little bit more loosey-goosey than a contract. You know, if a federal government grants to states sort of a block grant um, for emergency response, the state can do what it wants with that, you know, so long as it's carrying it out in goodwill. Contracts are going to be a lot more specific. The state is going to have to do certain things. So when you're entering into legal agreements, you always want to consider who are the parties, you know, because there can be more than two. What does each party have to do? Does each party have the authority to enter into that agreement and can they fulfill you know, their obligations? Are there any legal hindrances? Um, for instance, a lot of times states cannot utilize indemnity clauses. They cannot agree to indemnify an organization and that can become challenging during contract negotiation. So you wanna have that hashed out beforehand, not during an emergency. Um, you need to understand the process for utilizing these legal agreements. They need to be clear enough that somebody who's not familiar with them can still use them. And they also need to be reviewed and updated regularly. So all legal agreements require um, consideration. Uh, you have to have an offer, you've got to have acceptance, and you've got to have consideration. So there needs to be what we call a meeting of the minds. Um, and there needs to be something of value exchanged. So that's important in drafting. But drafting a legal agreement is also a practical consideration. Um, so the party that prepares the first draft is going to be more likely to protect their interests better than the party that doesn't. And that's why, you know, emergency managers should strive when possible uh, to ensure that it's their attorney, their legal team that is drafting the contract. Um, for some, this is going to be a given. You've already got standard contracts in place. But for others, you know, it's just something to think about. Additionally, it's important to understand that the court is going to read the contract as a whole. It's going to look to the ordinary meaning of words. Um, it's going to look to the intention of the parties. If the intent is unclear, then the court's probably going to look to custom and usage um, in a particular area, in a particular business or field, something like that. There are difficulties that arise when the parties to an agreement do not have a mutual understanding of what exactly they're agreeing to. So this is where you need to have the meeting of the minds and you want it in writing rather than being, uh, you know, an oral contract. You want to properly capture all of the promises made. Um, for public administrators, this often means incorporating your solicitation and your contractor's proposal into the contract. Um, that way, you sort of have the full agreement, and that will be important if the contractor doesn't provide the services that you are um, assuming that you'll get, or in any other form of lawsuit. All right, so uh, you don't have anything due this week, but memo two and discussion seven are both due um, at the end of week 13. You're 
free to post on the discussion board now. I, I see some folks already have been posting. In addition to the discussion that is due, the graded discussion on coronavirus response, I also opened up a uh, memo to discussion board. So as with our other assignments, I do encourage you to work collaboratively, um, bounce around ideas on that discussion board, uh, you know, talk about various legal citations, you know, whatever you need to do in order to write your memo. You've got to write and submit your own memo, but please feel free to work collaboratively. And if you've got questions, uh, you can ask me. So for the memo that is due, um, you should pretend that you work for the DC mayor's office. Uh, you're a legislative analyst, let's say, specializing in environmental and disaster law. And the fact pattern is that there have been a series of major accidents on the DC Beltway, uh, which passes through Maryland and Virginia, um, also on the DC Metro, which is the subway system. Some of these accidents have involved chemical spills and the mayor of DC wants the president to declare a major disaster or an emergency under the Stafford Act because the DC government is just overwhelmed by the sheer number of beltway crashes, metro fire, chemical spills, et cetera. Uh, she's concerned that the beltway's infrastructure has been significantly weakened, um, also concerned about uh, the subway infrastructure. And the mayor would like you to prepare a clear, concise memo, not to exceed three single spaced pages, that summarizes the steps that DC must take to obtain a presidential declaration under the Stafford Act, note any hurdles that DC might face in obtaining such a declaration, um, and also the types of relief that the district could request from the feds. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you for bearing with me on this sort of combo of week 12 and 13. Uh, I hope that you are all staying safe and well, and I will see you on the discussion boards.